True Crime Fix is a podcast with adult themes and graphic descriptions of crime which may not be considered suitable for all ages. Please use your discretion when listening. All research has been conducted using material in the public domain and some opinions may not be that of the author or the host. Please remember that all victims are someone's loved one and all episodes are recorded in the utmost respect of their memory. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the True Crime Fix podcast with Stevie B. This is a really well-known crime and it is very much a case of if you are British you can remember where you were when this murder took place. With regards to the aim of this episode though, although I'm going to address the whole situation and all aspects surrounding it, I do believe that doing it as a podcast which will focus as much as possible on the victim will take away from the horrific shock factor that has been portrayed in a number of documentaries and focus on the victim and his family. Just imagine your life ending because of the job you do and not because of who you are. You never saw it coming. You never stood a chance. To your murderers, you are not a person. You are a target because of the uniform you wear. In their eyes, you stand for everything they hate. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your true crime fix. I am your host Steve, and this episode is dedicated to the memory of Fusilier Lee Rigby. Born Lee James McClure on the 4th of July 1987 at 11.23am in the North Manchester Hospital. He was born to mother Lynn Seville and father Phil McClure. He had four sisters, Sarah, Chelsea, Courtney and Amy. Lee was raised in Crumpsall, a suburb three miles north of central Manchester. As a child, Lee studied at Middleton Technology School Lee suffered from dyslexia, which was not picked up at his school, and the teachers just thought that he was a troublesome child. As a result of his turbulent time at school, Lee's childhood was not easy. Although he did not fall foul of the law or have bad parents, the standard behaviour of teenagers and the constant bullying he was suffering brought on what his mother would describe as a vile temper. Her partner, Ian Rigby, whom she had met in 1999, was a calming influence on Lee. Lee was very close to Lynn's brother Mark, and with the fact that he was struggling at school and Uncle Mark was an ex-soldier, Lee seemed destined to join the armed forces. In 2006, Lee's mother married Ian Rigby. Lee had already decided to change his name by deed poll three years earlier when he had turned 16 to take his stepfather's last name as he had been there for him during that particularly turbulent time of his life. As soon as he turned 18, he went straight to the army recruitment offices in Rochdale, Greater Manchester to sign up. Lee actually failed the entrance exam twice before passing. The recruiting sergeant, who was coincidentally called Phil Rigby, but no relation, sat Lee down and it was the first time that he was actually diagnosed as being dyslexic. With the support of Phil and two months of adult learning, Lee finally passed the exam. Once enlisted, 
he completed an infantry training course at Catterick Garrison in North Yorkshire and was selected to be a member of the Corps of Drums posted to the 2nd Battalion, the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers. Life in the battalion took him to Cyprus as a machine gunner based in Dikelia. In 2008, Lee was posted back to London where he stood outside the Royal Palaces performing the battalion's public duties commitment. But like every serving soldier, he was due a spell in Afghanistan. During the summer of 2009, he was sent to Helmand province to spend six months at the remote, dusty, forward operating base called Patrol Base Wakab in Musakala. As a member of the fire support group, he was in Helmand during one of the worst periods of fighting against the Taliban and life in the base would have been without luxury and uncomfortable. Pot noodles were the food of choice rather than army ration packs. He was later posted to Germany before returning to the UK. In the two years prior to his death, he fulfilled a recruitment post in Woolwich and assisted with duties at regimental headquarters in the Tower of London. To those who commanded or served alongside him, Lee Rigby was an extremely popular and witty soldier who had been a lifelong supporter of Manchester United Football Club and was never shy about letting people know it. In October 2007, Lee married Rebecca Metcalf at St Anne in the Grove Church while serving in Southerham near Halifax, West Yorkshire. Together they had son Jack who was born in 2011. However, by the time of his death, Lee and Rebecca had become estranged and Lee was engaged to 22-year-old military policewoman Amy West, who he hoped to marry one day. For people who are unaware, Woolwich is part of the London Borough of Newham on the south of the River Thames and approximately 11 miles from London's Trafalgar Square. Woolwich has a long military history since the dockyard was built in the 16th century. It was originally the home of the Warren, which became the Royal Arsenal at the start of the early 19th century. Government House dates back to 1781, housing the garrison commandment from 1855 to 1995. It was also home of the Royal Artillery Museum until 2016, as well as the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery. The main building, however, is the Royal Artillery Barracks, originally completed in 1776. In 1973, the barracks were designated a Grade 2 listed building. A Grade 2 listed building in the UK is defined as a building, object or structure that has been judged to be of national importance in terms of architectural or historical interest and included on a special register called the List of Buildings of Special Architectural or Historical Interest. During the 2012 Olympic Games, a number of shooting events were held at the barracks. The United Kingdom is no stranger to acts of terrorism from bombs of the Irish Republican Army to the attacks of July the 7th, 2005. On the 23rd of May, 2013, in the area surrounding John Wilson Street in Woolwich, London, Lee Rigby lost his life in a brutal broad daylight attack which stunned the British public and caused tensions to rise again between different cultures within the United Kingdom. The timeline of events 
have been reported as follows. At 1pm on that fateful day, two men, Michael Adebalajo and Michael Adebowali, left Adebalajo's address at Greenwich House in Oakwood Close, Lewisham, five and a half miles south of Woolwich. They left driving a 1995 navy blue Vauxhall Tigra and drove along the A205 South Circular towards Woolwich High Street. The day before, Adebalajo had visited an Argos store on Lewisham High Street and bought a five-piece kitchen knife set and a knife sharpener for £44.98. For any sales personnel, it was a simple everyday home purchase, but unfortunately, the purpose of these items in the wrong hands ultimately proved to be a fatal mix. At 1.30pm, the Tigra was spotted travelling along Wellington Street and Artillery Place in Woolwich before continuing onto an area just south of Woolwich Ferry. I have included a map of the relevant areas on the show's social media pages. They then continued to drive around for a while until at 2.13pm Adebalajo and Adebowali are again spotted on Wellington Street, parked facing Artillery Place. So what do we know about these two men? Michael Adebalajo was born in 1985 and Michael Adebowali was born in 1991. They were both born into Christian families of Nigerian descent and both at one time had attended the University of Greenwich. Both men had since converted to Islam and had been radicalised. For the time being, I will not go into further detail about the two men's upbringing, but will return to this later in the episode. At 2.10pm, Lee Rigby, wearing a navy blue Help for Heroes hoodie and carrying an army backpack, arrived at Woolwich Arsenal, Docklands Light Railway Station. He had been attending a recruitment fair at the Tower of London. Upon exiting the station, Lee walked along Wellington Street before crossing John Wilson Street, then entering Artillery Place, moving away from the army barracks towards a shop on the other side of the road. In distance, the walk is approximately 500 metres in total. At 2.18pm, Adebalajo, who was driving, spotted Lee's hoodie and identified him as the soldier that they had been hunting. Adebalajo deliberately drove at Lee at a speed between 30 and 40 miles per hour, which is 48 to 64 kilometres per hour, as he crossed the road at Artillery Place, pinning him against a road sign on the pavement. Both men then exited the vehicle, which had been badly damaged in the attack. Armed with a meat cleaver, the previously bought knives and a 90-year-old 9.4mm calibre Dutch revolver, eyewitnesses reports state that the two men attacked the motionless body of Lee Rigby, which was laying on the pavement still at the time. It is reported that Adebalajo was making attempts to decapitate him. Three minutes later, Adebalajo and Adebowali dragged the lifeless body of Lee Rigby into the middle of the road from the pavement and instead of making any escape, they stood around, covered in their victim's blood, bragging about the crime which had just taken place, urging passers-by to film the incident. A video obtained by a number of news outlets shows Adebalajo telling passers-by, The only reason that we have killed this man today is because Muslims are dying daily at the hands of British soldiers. This British soldier is one. He is an eye for an eye 
and a tooth for a tooth. You people will never be safe. Remove your governments, they don't care about you. During this time, Adabalajo handed a letter to witness Amanda Donnelly Martin when she arrived on the scene shortly after the murder. The letter was addressed to my beloved children and read like a suicide note. It urged people to seek martyrdom and stated that if you find yourself curious as to why carnage is reaching your towns, then know it's simply in retaliation for the oppression in our towns. One of the first eyewitnesses on the scene was a French-born scout leader from Cornwall, Ingrid Leo Kennett. She was returning from a trip to see relatives in France and having just visited her children in Plumstead was on her way to Victoria to catch a coach back to Cornwall. As she sat watching the world go by with her suitcases on the number 53 bus, it passed through Woolwich on its way to Parliament Square. It was here that she was suddenly forced as she described it, to confront evil. In an interview with the Guardian newspaper, which was published on the 27th of May 2013, her testimony gave an insight to the state of mind of Adabalajo and Adabawali straight after the attack, as well as the reactions of the public in the immediate aftermath. Ingrid said, and I quote, I went to the body and started to take his pulse, but a Caribbean lady kneeling by his side said, no, 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 he's dead. I asked if she was sure, and she said yes. Ingrid said that she still felt for a pulse because her first aid training made her think a severed artery in his arm might have weakened the flow of blood to his wrist. She was told by someone, later identified as one of the perpetrators, don't touch the body, go away. Around her, she estimated that 60 to 70 people had gathered at a distance, all watching, some filming with their phones, none offering to help. Meanwhile, the woman sitting by Lee Rigby's side was stroking his back and it was reported later praying for him. Ingrid then said, I stood up and asked, why? Why don't you want me to touch the body? The man stared hard back at her, told her that the victim was a British soldier and that he had killed Muslim people in other countries. Ingrid continued, I looked at the body and he didn't look like a soldier to me. Instinctively and through my scout training, I like to keep calm and be respectful, so I thought, okay, let's listen to what he has to say. I tried to engage him in conversation. Talk soon moved to the subject of British foreign policy. Ingrid states, I said to him that I'm sorry that this happens in other countries, that he was naming Afghanistan, Iraq, etc., and I agreed with him that this shouldn't happen. He was saying that women and children were being killed just because they were Muslims and they dropped their bombs and no one cares. I said, I know, it's very sad, but I said to him, yes, it's happening, but what do you want now? She asked him if he needed a car or money to help him flee, but I really didn't want to influence him in any way. I want to fight, he said. In London, I asked. Yes, I want a war in London. I said he couldn't do that, and why didn't he just join a proper army in those countries and kill as many people as he wanted to there? That would be more useful than just being in London doing this. He told me he wanted to do it in London. I told him that the police would arrive soon. I don't care, he said. I'm going to fight them 
and shoot them. As the drama and jeopardy intensified, Ingrid kept one ear open for the police sirens, convinced that they must be racing to the scene. But there was nothing. She stated she was worried that if another British soldier walked by, he might see that and attack him. And I didn't want him to see the police trying to do something. If possible, I wanted him to see nothing. I wanted him focused on me. He was very agitated and pacing back and forth close to me. He was really upset. He was educated and had good English. I just thought, talk to me, talk to me. They stayed talking for a period of time longer with Adebolajo discussing foreign policy and justifying the attack. A woman then approached Ingrid tentatively and asked her to leave. Adebolajo made a point of saying that the women and children were safe but they would need to keep back when the police arrived. But then Ingrid noticed her bus starting to pull away. I was suddenly thinking that my luggage is on board and I'm going to miss my coach to Cornwall. I thought to myself I'd done as much as I could here. I looked at the guys and asked them if they were sure they didn't need a car or something. They said no. I said, are you okay because I'm going to have to go now? They said, no problem. First emergency service responders arrived at approximately 2.29pm, setting up a cordon to keep the gathering crowds back but remained behind it until their armed colleagues arrived five minutes later. Upon their arrival, Adabalajo and Adabawali, the former brandished a meat cleaver and the latter brandishing a revolver, which after the fact was revealed by police to have not been loaded, ran at the police. Armed officers opened fire on the two men with non-fatal wounds but these caused the men to fall to the ground. It was later revealed that the intention of the two attackers involved being shot dead by the police so that they would have become martyrs. One of the armed responders, known only as D-49, told the jury at the subsequent trial, I saw a black male running towards me waving both his hands in the air in a chopping motion. In his right hand, I saw what I call a meat cleaver or machete. I instinctively thought, he's going to kill me. I went to draw my Glock. Due to my position in the car, the internal door has a panel jutting out. I could not immediately draw my Glock out due to this. It was a split second decision to draw my taser. I could see the look in the suspect's eyes. They were so wide and I could see the whites of them. He was shouting something. She then spoke of the second suspect, Adabawali, who was holding the gun. I thought, oh my god, he's going to shoot me. I feared for my life. Following the incident, Commander Simon Letchford gave the following report to the awaiting media. Good evening, I'm here to give you an update about an incident that's currently unfolding uh, this afternoon in Woolwich. And to give you further de details of the situation. As you can understand, this situation is fastly um, evolving, uh, evolving and at this stage I can only give you the information that I have available. At approximately 2.20 this afternoon, police officers were called to an assault in John Wilson Street, Woolwich, where one man was being assaulted by two other men. A number of weapons were reported as being used, including a report of a firearm. Officers, including local officers from Greenwich Police Station and shortly, fire, shortly after firearms officers, attended the scene. On arrival, they found a man who was later pronounced dead. At this early stage, I'm unable to provide any more information about the man who has died. Two men, who we believe from earlier reports to have been carrying weapons, were shot by police. They have both been taken to separate London uh, hospitals and are receiving treatment for their injuries. 
I can understand that this incident will cause community concern and I would like to reiterate that we are investigating the circumstances of this incident. The NPS will investigate the circumstances of this man's death and the Independent Police Complaints Authority, or sorry, Commission, as is routine, will investigate the circumstances involving the discharge of police firearms. There will continue to be a police presence in this area tonight and in the surrounding areas and this presence will continue as long as it is necessary. I would ask people to remain calm and to avoid unnecessary speculation. I will update you further when I have more information. Thank you. A devastated Rigby family gave the following tribute to him. Ian Rigby read the tribute to his stepson. What can we say about Lee, our hero? We are so proud of Lee. When he was born, the family adored him. It was a precious gift given to us. Lee had a fiery temper. When he was younger, I used to sit on him until he calmed down. Until he was about 15, then he got too big, and he used to sit on me. Lee's dream of growing up was always to join the army, which he succeeded in doing. He was dedicated and loved his job. Lee adored and cared a lot for all his family, and he was very much a family man, looking out for his wife, his young son Jack, and his younger sisters, who in turn looked up to him. He always had a banter with them, but would never ever let any harm come to them. He was over the moon being a dad and an uncle, and he adored all his family. Lee was a man who loved people. He had many friends growing up in Middleton and on army duties all over the world where he'd been sent. He believed life was for living and he would be sorely missed by all who knew it. Courtney and Amy, his younger sisters, wrote this for Lee. Rest in peace, Lee. We loved you so much and you didn't deserve this. You fought for your country and did it well. You will always be our hero. We are just upset you left us so early. We love you, Lee. Good night. The last text he sent to his mum read, Good night, man. I hope you had a fantastic day today because you are the most fantastic one in a million mum that anyone could ever wish for. Thank you for supporting me all these years. You're not just my mum, you're my best friend. Good night and love you loads. We would like to say good night, Lee. Rest in peace, our fallen soldier. We love you loads and words God not describe how loved and sad we miss you will be. Lee's mother revealed that Lee should not have been at Artillery Place when he was. The night before the murder, he had worked at a recruiting and hospitality event at the Tower of London. As a result of the successful day, Lee had had a night out on the town with his army friends. He got in at 4am the following morning, but was still at work for 8am. As the day went on, his boss took pity on him and sent him home early at midday to catch up on sleep. He should have got back to Woolwich at 6pm, thus not coming into contact with Adebolajo and Adebowale. So what caused these two men to behave the way they did? Tom Whitehead of the Daily Telegraph wrote a story on the two of them that was published on the 15th of November 2014. It read, They were polite, nice guys from strict Christian families. Michael Adebolajo's passions were music, football and girls. Michael Adebowale was a lovable, quiet boy who enjoyed cooking Jamie Oliver recipes. Yet, during their teens, these two East London boys descended into a life of petty street crime and drugs before converting to Islamic extremism, which drove them to commit the brutal murder of drummer Lee Rigby. Adebolajo is the son of Anthony and Ibitoy 
Adebalajo, Nigerian immigrants who settled in Romford, where Michael and his three siblings were born. During the trial, he told the court how his mother taught him to pray, but that a Jehovah's Witness, named only as Ron, fired his interest in religion. One of his best friends at school was Kirk Redpath, who joined the Irish Guards and became a drummer before being killed in Iraq in 2007. Adebalajo would later blame Tony Blair for his death. Redpath's younger brother, Grant, recalled how they would sit in Adebalajo's garage playing computer games and listening to music. Back then, it was music, football and girls, he said. Michael did a lot of emceeing and was really good at it. I just don't know what happened to him in the last 10 years. After leaving school, Adebalajo became involved in gangs, smoking marijuana and dealing drugs. One former classmate said that he had changed quite dramatically and started robbing people at knife point. A former neighbour said he got caught up with the wrong people. The people that he hung around with, they were a bad crowd. It was around the time that Adebalajo began showing interest in Islam. In an attempt to keep him out of trouble, his parents moved him from Romford to a smart detached house in Saxelbury near Lincoln, the very heart of Middle England. But the move did not succeed in turning Adebalajo away from radical Islam. He moved back to London and studied at Greenwich University. He converted to Islam in 2003 and was radicalised by Bakari Muhammad, the so-called Tottenham Ayatollah. He had been thrown out of Britain when he was the leader of the now banned extremist group El Majaroun. Adebalajo was also taken under the wing of Bakari's lieutenant Anjam Chowdhury. One former friend said Adebalajo locked himself in a room with this bloke for a few hours and when he came out he was a Muslim convert. He was spouting all kinds of stuff and said that he had changed his name. Adebalajo began calling himself Mujahid meaning warrior, a name he insisted on being called throughout his trial. Speaking from Beirut where he now lives in exile Bakari said of Adebalajo. At the time, there were a lot of conflicts around the world, and in Iraq and Afghanistan especially. We talked to him about these and he sympathised with the Muslim people, it seemed. He was a quiet boy who didn't ask many questions. Adebalajo became more extreme and took part in numerous Islamic protests in London. He also fathered six children, one born just four days before Mr Rigby's murder. In 2006, he was arrested during a violent demonstration outside the Old Bailey, where fellow fanatics were on trial accused of solicitating murder and inciting racial hatred following the publication of the cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad in a Danish newspaper. In 2007, he was filmed by the BBC protesting outside Paddington Green Police Station after the arrest of another fanatic. He was seen holding a placard which complained of a crusade against Muslims. In 2008, he spent three months in custody after assaulting a police officer. The following year, a video showed him ranting on a platform in front of young Muslims outside a North London mosque. He told them, don't be scared of the filthy kafur, non-believers, they are pigs. His activities escalated in 2010 when Kenyan authorities seized him 
along with a group of other youths trying to cross the border into Somalia. It was believed that he wanted to join the Somali terrorist group Al-Shabaab. He appeared in court but was not charged. The circumstances of his return home remain unclear but Kenyan officials claimed that the British authorities treated the case very lightly and did not take his threat seriously enough. It raises the question as to why Adebolajo was not put under greater surveillance or prosecuted in the United Kingdom on his return from Africa. It is understood that he was approached by MI5 either to see what intelligence they could glean from him or to see if he could spy on other militants. Close relations including his brother Jeremiah have said they were contacted by MI6. Jeremiah claimed his brother was mistreated in Kenya and that the security services were putting a lot of pressure on him up to a few months before the Woolwich attack. He added the events were inevitable. There was eventually going to be another attack which mentioned foreign policy as its justification. Bob Quick, the former Metropolitan Police Assistant Commissioner, told the BBC's Panorama that Adebolajo would have constantly featured as someone of interest after his Kenyan adventure. A street project designed to tackle extremism also raised concerns about him but engagement with him stopped in 2011 when the government cut funding. For Adebowale, who was born in Eltham, South East London and attended Kidbrook School in Greenwich, the first steps down the road to extremism came at the age of just 10. Before that, he was normal and was smiling all the time, said Lukman Sise, one of his schoolmates. A former neighbour said, he used to talk to me very enthusiastically about cooking and his recipes. He loved Jamie Oliver and had his books. But more recently, he would put his head down when he saw me. Even if I tried to talk to him, he was very dismissive. I thought it was weird. Adabawali saw the images of the 9-11 attacks on the television and would later tell psychiatrists that he had been brainwashed by society from an early age. Known as Toby to his friends, he is the son of Juliet Abbaswai, who was 43, a probation officer, and Adenyeni Adabwali, who worked at the Nigerian High Commission in London. The couple split up after Michael was born and Mrs. Abbaswai was left to raise her son alone. As a teenager, Adabawali was involved in the Woolwich Boys, a notorious London street gang dominated by Muslim youths of Somali origin. He began suffering from psychosis after seeing a friend whom he was selling drugs with stabbed to death. Michael Adabawali was knifed in the shoulder and hand in this attack. Psychiatrists later identified this as the start of psychological problems for Adabawali exasperated by heavy smoking of skunk cannabis. His mother began losing control and while at school he was mentored by Richard Taylor, the father of murdered schoolboy Damalola, but to little effect. Mr. Taylor said, he was a young, lovable, quiet boy. From there, I started to know him, meet him, and then suddenly his mum was calling me, saying that she needed help, that the boy was having problems in school, that he comes home and was crying and saying he was being bullied. Suddenly, I started hearing that he was getting involved in issues around drugs and gangs and I was not very happy with that. 
In 2009, the year after the stabbing, Adabawali was sent to a young offenders institution for possession with intent to supply drugs. When he came out, he began wearing Islamic robes and became more heavily involved in the more extreme versions of the religion, including handing out extremist literature. Mr. Taylor believes he was radicalised in detention. Something must have gone wrong in prison, he told ITV News. They must have indoctrinated him in the wrong way. Mr. Taylor last saw him in March 2013, just two months before the murder, but he was already a fully committed Islamist militant by then. In 2011, after her son had dropped out of university, Mrs. Abbaswai told a neighbour, Michael is not listening anymore. His older sister is a good Christian with a degree, but Michael is rebelling as he has no father figure, dropping out of university and handing out leaflets in Woolwich Town Centre. Adabawali became associated with Al Mujaroon and was seen by police taking part in a protest outside the US Embassy in September 2012. Here is an excerpt of Adabalajo's police interview. We decided to wait. In the vicinity of the barracks that is in Woolwich. By the Qadr of Allah, by Allah's decree, whilst waiting to find a soldier, because between us we decided that the soldier is the most fair target because he joins the army with a with, with kind of an understanding that your life is at risk when you join the army, you know? Um, so we sat in wait and uh, it just so happened that he was the soldier that was spotted first. One of the key quotes from this interview was the most humane way to kill any animal is to cut the jugular. He may have been my enemy, but he is also a man, so I struck at the neck and attempted to remove the head. The inquest into the death of Lee Rigby started on the 31st of May 2013 at Southwark Crown Court. The inquest heard that dental records had to be used to identify Lee Rigby. The post-mortem report stated that Lee had died of multiple incised wounds. The funeral ceremonies began on the 11th of July 2013, the day before the main funeral was due to take place. Lee's coffin, draped in the Union Jack flag, was carried to Berry Parish Church where his body would be guarded during an overnight vigil by his comrades in arms from the Fusiliers. The procession began late in the afternoon and 22 family members made up the sombre cortege of cars as it snaked its way slowly the two miles from the Red Hall Hotel in Bury towards the church that had long been the garrison chapel for the Fusiliers. The procession was led by a corps of two dozen drummers in scarlet tunics as they marched to a beat. Another comrade carried Lee's ceremonial bearskin hat in a mark of respect. It was a really spectacular fanfare for Lee. The standard bearers held their flags proudly aloft and then solemnly dropped them in honour of Lee's coffin as it passed by. It was an horrendous afternoon particularly for Lee's fiancée Amy because army rules said that she was not allowed to be in the church 
for the arrival of Lee's coffin. She was devastated and had to stand outside with the crowds to watch her beloved partner being carried from his hearse. Lee's sister Sarah managed to sneak her in later that night so that she was able to say a proper goodbye. Lee Rigby's military funeral took place on the 12th of July 2013 at Berry's Parish Church in Greater Manchester, where his commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Jim Taylor, gave his eulogy. Lee's son Jack was wearing a t-shirt which showed the words, My Daddy, My Hero. The funeral was also attended by then Prime Minister David Cameron and he was accompanied by the then Mayor of London, Boris Johnson. The funeral saw an outpouring of public emotion as well as his funeral being broadcast to thousands outside the church as well as to others nationwide. Following the funeral, Fusilier Lee Rigby was laid to rest in a private burial at Middleton Cemetery. Both men were charged with murder and attempting to murder a police officer on that day as well as planning to murder a police officer on or before that day appeared via video link from Her Majesty's Prison Belmarsh on the 27th of September 2013. Having been assessed as to their mental capacity in hospital both men pled not guilty to all charges. The trial of Adabalajo and Adabawali started on the 29th of November 2013 at the Old Bailey in London with prosecutor William Whittam QC and the judge Nigel Sweeney presiding. Throughout the trial graphic details and CCTV footage was shown to the jury outlining the narrative that has been explained throughout this episode. The jury heard in graphic detail from Prosecutor Richard Whittam QC in his closing speech who described how Lee Rigby suffered at least 14 stab wounds causing damage to the bone and cartilage of the off-duty soldier's face and neck. Defence lawyer David Gottlieb said the false impression had been given that innocent members of the public were vulnerable when in fact Lee Rigby's camouflage backpack and demeanour made him a clear military target. Mr Gottlieb also told the jury that his defendant, Mr Adebolajo, had been demonised in the media and politicians who played on issues including ethnicity and Islam in the aftermath of the attack and clouded the truth. In his closing speech, Mr Whittam said, What these two men did, crashing their car and breaking the back of Lee Rigby and then killing him, is indefensible in the law of this country. He went on, Killing to make a political point, to frighten the public, to put pressure on the government, or as an expression of anger is murder and remains murder, whether the government in question is a good one, a bad one, or a dreadful one. In his closing speech, Mr Gottlieb said, all deaths outside of lawful deaths are cruel, needless and unnecessary. Do you think really that this is the cruelest, most sadistic, most callous, most cowardly killing that has ever occurred in our nation's history? It isn't. He asked the jury to consider whether the prosecution had put their case on the basis that this was a cowardly and callous act to inflame or distract them from the view that the death must be murder and nothing else. Mr Gottlieb told the jury that they genuinely had a choice to acquit his client and that they will be under pressure from the outside, from the mob, from the world to convict. He said that the prosecution's case lacks any sense of proportion or of ridiculousness. On the 19th of December 2013, 
the Old Bailey jury of eight women and four men took approximately 90 minutes to reach their verdict. Guilty. On the 26th of February 2014, they were sentenced to life in prison, with Ada Bellagio being given a whole life order and Ada Bawali ordered to serve at least 45 years. On the 3rd of December 2014, Rigby's killers lost legal challenges to their sentences. Michael Adebolajo had attempted to have his conviction overturned and the whole life sentence reduced, while Michael Adebowale attempted a reduction in his minimum sentence of 45 years. A permanent memorial to Lee Rigby was unveiled at Middleton Memorial Gardens in Greater Manchester on Sunday the 29th of March 2015. Greenwich Council announced that a plaque bearing his name would be added to the To All Fallen Service Men and Women in the St George's Chapel Garden opposite Woolwich Barracks where Rigby was based. A newspaper report in June 2017 stated that one of Lee Rigby's murderers is now considered Britain's most dangerous prisoner and staff do not have enough funds to stop him brainwashing other inmates. Michael Adebolajo is now an inmate at Her Majesty's Prison Frankland in County Durham in the northeast of England, a maximum security prison which also houses Yorkshire Ripper Peter Sutcliffe, sick child murderer Ian Huntley and serial killer Levi Belfield and they are not able to properly monitor Adebolajo. The source said if he is suspected of trying to radicalise other inmates we step in and move him. But even in prison Adebolajo cannot be watched all the time. We don't have enough staff or the resources. Adebolajo has been given special category status and has even converted non-Muslims to his twisted interpretation of Islam. In June 2018, Michael Adebolajo apologised for the first time for the murder of Fusilier Lee Rigby, saying he was brainwashed and misinterpreted the Quran. Adebolajo, who was 33 at the time, expressed remorse and regret for murdering Lee Rigby and planned to write a letter of apology to the drummer's family, according to a prison source. As for Lynn, she decided that she was going to do three things to cement Lee's legacy. The first was with assistance from Rosie Dunn, was she was able to write a book about her son called Lee Rigby, A Mother's Story. And having read the book in researching for this episode, it is a fantastic read and you get the feeling that you know Lee, the individual, at the end of it. The second was to have a permanent memorial and this, as mentioned previously, is in Woolwich. Finally, she wanted to set up a charity in Lee's name, the Lee Rigby Foundation, and this was established on the 27th of April 2016 with the aim to support persons suffering from bereavement or loss, relieving mental and physical distress and saving lives through contact, support and holistic alternative care by providing retreat and respite centres and promoting activities proven to benefit from health. If you are listening to this episode on the release date, you will notice that this charity was started three years ago today. I will also post a link to this charity on the social media pages. Lynn will forever ensure that the legacy of her son, who passed away in such a tragic way, will live on. So that is it for this week. Please remember 
If you enjoy the show or want to know more, please follow us on Twitter at True Crime Fix Pod. That's at True Crime Fix Pod on Twitter. Or look out for our Facebook page, True Crime Fix Podcast. That's True Crime Fix Podcast on Facebook. I'll be posting information about the week's case on there. I also have an Instagram account, so search True Crime Fix on Instagram. But I'm being honest, I'm not really sure how to use it. Also, if you have any suggestions or feedback for the show, please contact me at True Crime Fix Podcast. That's True Crime Fix Podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, stay safe, look after each other, and live life to the fullest because you never know who or what might be coming around the next corner. Take care, everybody. <laughs>